and they are wasting their time and they are stupid because it's a video game and none of it really matters. But for just a little while, they can convince themselves that's not true. But whenever you have people that are able to pay money and rocket past you, the illusion is broken and it's not real. I am pro delusion. Yes, I am pro delusion because a delusion, a, 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 a happy delusion is better than a sad reality. One of the biggest elements of escapism in video games, and this is especially true for young guys. If you're a 16 year old guy, if you're a 19 year old guy, you're probably a fucking loser. You don't have any skills. Nobody's going to pay you to do shit. You have no resources. You're, you're good at nothing. And hopefully you get hired at Taco Bell. You're a level five. But you can go to these fantasy worlds and you can be on the same playing field, playing field as somebody who makes a million dollars a year. What up, boys? A surprising ton of events has just dropped for 2024, sending everyone into a spiral of concern or excitement mm -hmm. for this highly anticipated yeah, MMO. Bro, we went hard MMO as fuck on we this only game. just got our first taste of a mere two yeah. months ago. We knew their Alpha 2 was coming sometime soon, but as their Alpha tests are limited invite only... Bro, the next time they do a beta, we're gonna build Minas Tirith. We're gonna build Minas Tirith. Oh, 100%. I don't know how we're gonna be able to get the white, the white tree. I'm not sure yet. We'll figure that out. The announcement of Pax Pay entering early Three? access hey, in yo, spring I was farming. this year Shut up. is a genuinely unexpected I was. surprise. Ask, but ask him. Before we get into that, our beautiful patrons mm -hmm. and coped out the wazoo Twitch subs and I would love for you to grab yourself a Copa Cola because today I'm going to give you guys the news, talk about my thoughts on the early access and hopefully answer as many concerns as possible based off the information we know at the time of this video. Now, with all that bollocks out of the way, let's begin, shall we? The release date? Yeah, what is this? I didn't even know so they So we'll had of course start date. with the, the actual announcement, as it did come with a new yeah. trailer related to NVIDIA DLSS3. As it seems Mainframe are partnering with GeForce to enhance the game. Wow, awesome. Like that. They explained that DLSS3 yeah. allows the game to run at much smoother frames, which is of course great news, as uh -huh. this game is quite heavy on those system requirements. Well, yeah, I mean, this is a very high definition game. This is huge. Yeah, DLSS3 is insane. I'm telling you guys, like, everybody always looks at better graphics, but like, we're seeing a plateau on graphics, clearly, right? We're seeing a plateau on graphics because things can only be so close to reality. Like, getting from 98 to 99% close to reality isn't as big of a deal from getting to, you know, 80 to 90. And so now you're seeing a lot of innovation and in technology for performance. And I think DLSS is the best example of that. It's incredible to see what they did. Like, I, I feel like I'd have to learn and like educate myself for like months, probably maybe even years to even understand how DLSS really works. Because like to me, it's like, how does it work? Simple. Same way as magic. Fucking miracles. But wait, there's more. They also announced that they're working on making Payday available on that. GeForce Now, a cloud gaming service. Look at that. What is cloud gaming? Uh, I don't know. So let's move on to the main part of the video. The cloud word. gaming is the future. It's just Google was too early. Microsoft made an iPad in 1998. They were just too early. Release date, or well, the early access release date. We can discuss the thematics about this later in the video. Mm -hmm. Spring 2024 yeah, is confirmed, too. and everyone can gain access to the game and play to their heart's content for the small, small price of we don't know yet. Yeah. But why are they Hilarious. doing this? Well, luckily they answered this very question, and their statement reads the following: <gasps> oh my God. Our game requires a community to come alive. In a sense, the recent alpha was the first time we saw the game we're making. Yeah. The feedback we've received is invaluable for making- Yeah, I talk to the developers a lot about the game and everything. Like, I'm, I'm very positive about this game. Obviously, you know, we'll have to see what happens, how they're going to market the game, monetize it, everything like that. A lot of these things are up for, you know- uh, you know, uh, I don't- who knows what's going to happen, right? Who knows what's going to happen? But right now, I am very excited for this game. I am extremely excited. Does this game exist? It does. I played it. 
making sure we're going in the right direction, knowing how to improve what we already have, and deciding what to build next. Yeah. Going into early access will allow us to get that feedback loop going permanently. We'll right. also reinvest the revenue from early access into making the game better and bigger, and fulfill our vision of a living, breathing world that can be your virtual home for years to come. In this every is very true. Uh, I think one of the biggest weaknesses the game had, from like my perspective, was the lack of urgency to log on regularly and to have content to do. I felt like this game, it was like it was an MMO that had the progression cycle of Valheim. I love Valheim. I love MMOs. But one of the things that I like about MMOs is that there are continuous ways that you can improve and make your character better. And I don't know if PAX Day had enough of those. And that's my opinion. Like, I, I don't know if I'm right about that yet. But that's like, that's my, my first impression read. Way, PAX Day will only exist with the support of its players. True. We'll be sharing all the details about early access as we get closer. In the meantime, our team are hard at work preparing the game for something that will come earlier, our second alpha. Ooh. More on that before too long. I'm excited. And this is all great news. But it was followed up with a brief FAQ that puts a few concerns to rest. Mainly, the pricing and content of early access. Ooh. They state we're currently I don't give a fuck about this by the way if you want to charge people for early access that's totally fine I'm completely okay with that I think it comes with its own set of advantages and disadvantages advantages is that you make the game for the people that are literally invested disadvantages is that you don't make the game for people that are fair weather players who will always make up the majority of your player base. So you curate an audience of people that are very invested. And because of that, you develop the game in a certain way. So I think that, again, it's, it's like it, there are advantages and disadvantages to each one. Finalizing our early access offers and can't share but the yes, specifics But yes, and I right want to make now. sure this what is very clear. I, I don't think that there is anything wrong to charge for early access. There's nothing wrong with it. It's completely fine. Ready indicate at this point is that monetization will take the form of a single purchase, granting access to the game for the full duration of early access. Okay, sure. More to come as we get closer. Are they talking now, about monetization sharing... for the game in early access or monetization for the game in general? But yeah, I think they're talking about just early access, but I'm not sure more as we get closer seems to be the motto of mainframe at this point but overall yeah. it sounds pretty standard for early access there are other sure. <clears throat> mmos that have released recently into early access namely palea but this went into early access and promised persistence and mm -hmm. no wipes but also have a bunch of pretty expensive microtransactions they're trying to sell whilst currently in early access too so palea and new world are actually having a competition it's who can make the most unappealing store asset armor sets. And it's a really tight race. Each one just keeps out doing the other. That really sucks. It doesn't appear mainframe are going the same route, however, which is great news. The previously spoke about optional sub fee, the cosmetic store and token are not going to be present during this testing phase. And they have indeed confirmed that there will be the occasional wipe. So this is by all means a be EA before a wipe. Oh, well, he's talking about a wipe during early access. OK, that's fine proper early access testing faves to improve the game not a quick cash grab mm -hmm. and it's also probably not even fair to call this a release although i would argue people well, no no i don't understand why people are so weird about this it is a cash grab they're looking to grab cash and fund the game and they're looking to do that through funding people having people fund it by buying early access and that's totally okay First impressions will be shaped by the state Nothing of this wrong game, with that. and that leads me in games to my cost money points. My opinions on this matter. So my Baldur's main Gate concern is yeah. the length of time that we've had since the first test and this upcoming early access. With their Alpha 2 coming very soon, uh, that mm -hmm. being this quarter, and no, then I the paid early access coming in quarter two, how much can the team really add or change in this short amount of time? They seem pretty confident with themselves, and that's great, but the team also seem quite disconnected with what makes a game... Uh, a game 
it, you know? In my opinion, the state of the game back in November was not in a state that was worth paying money for. Ironic, I know, coming from a guy who supports Ashes of Creation's $250 alpha access, but I do not support Ashes of Creation's funding methods. I'm very open about this. I haven't given Ashes of Creation a penny, nor will I ever during its alpha testing. I do- But, I mean, I don't see this as being a problem. Like, I, I don't think it's a bad, a bad thing for somebody to be funded through their audience i think it's actually a good thing because then you're accountable to an audience because these people are going to need to get the money no matter what and one of the realities of game development is that if they don't get the money from let's say the fans well then they're going to get the money from an investor and the investor is going to care more about making their money back than making a good game so I think that any game that goes with fan funding is probably a good thing. That doesn't mean that fan funding is always perfect and it's a, it's a solution. No, it's not. But at the same time, sometimes you do enter into a Faustian pact with a producer or sorry, a publisher or with a investment company or something like that. And, and you're locked into doing something that makes you uncomfortable or bothers your community. So uh, I think that really letting people make their own decision is the best idea possible. I do not agree with supporting vaporware through monetary methods. I instead dedicate my whole life to it, apparently. Yeah. But I digress. Uh, Payday's alpha was exactly how they mm -hmm. stated it was. An early alpha. And many systems, mechanics, and content was missing or Yeah, dark and darker. The, yeah, early access funded their legal battles. Yeah, and it also will fund the rest of development of the game. The combat, the dungeons, mm -hmm. the mob AI, the balancing, the progression, and of course, the recognizably procedurally generated world. Uh, don't get me wrong. I think one thing this game needs is it needs the 80-20 rule of reality. What makes the Black Forest so special in Valheim? The trolls. Because almost everything else in the Black Forest is kind of real, right? I mean, like, these monsters are there. Yeah, I guess they're fake, but they're just like, whatever, right? It's the trolls. 80% real, 20% fantasy. I think PAX Day is too real, and I would love to see, like, a, a Norse giant walking around. We need some fell reavers. What about, like, an elephant? What about, like, um, like a hippo? What about you go into the water and there's, like, a kraken at the bottom of the water, the bottom of the ocean, something like that, you know? Yeah, and so, like, yeah, add in some different types of, like, monsters and, and creatures. Elephants are fantasy? Well, yeah, yeah, I mean, it, well, I guess, yeah, it's a good point, right? Yeah, elephants, yeah, no, there's no way elephants can be real. We'll just look at them, bro. Like, you ever seen one? No, I, yeah, me either. A fucking fake, man. So, yeah, you want to have, like, a giant turkey, yeah, or just a dragon. Fuck. Like, at the highest peak of this game, there should be a dragon. Why? What do you mean, why? There should be a fucking dragon there. It's that simple. Or griffins, yeah. It was a very beautiful... And, and, like, that's how you create a fantasy world that's grounded in realism. I think that that's really... Those are the fantasy games, and the fantasies that are the most powerful are the ones that follow that 80-20 rule. Like, and there's some, there's some like, for example, like uh, Conan the Barbarian. Like, you know, he fucks that chick and she turns into, like, some, like, weird creature. And then Methuselah Doom can turn into a serpent. But, like, other than that, Conan is, like, all real. It's 100% fucking real besides those little two things. Lord of the Rings. Like, actual, like, the original trilogy. Most of the things that happened in Lord of the Rings are pretty grounded. And then the one time with, like, the Balrog, it's like, holy fuck. Right. And it like it creates like a degree of spectacle and like uh, of perspective that really makes the world feel that much bigger. Well, fantasy was soft magic. Yeah, exactly. Like, I mean, it's not like, you know, uh, even even Gandalf, look at like Gandalf fighting with Saruman in, in like uh, Fellowship of the Ring. They're really just pushing each other around with their staves. They're not having some Hogwarts fucking Harry Potter versus uh, Voldemort, you know, fucking battle of, of magic and like you can see it and there's like colors everywhere. No, it, it's just it's very it's very grounded. Yeah, the, the hobbits. Yeah, look at the hobbits. Yeah, that could be real. Sure. They're just short people. That's what makes something like that so good. But again, the fantasy is that 20 percent and that 20 percent transforms the other 80 percent into being fantasy. Unreal Engine 5 world, and but I think they will do almost this. Almost 
every single aspect that qualified it as a game. Now, I know you guys get super upset when I start to compare uh -huh. Pax Day to Ashes of Creation, but <laughs> that's what I do. I view Ashes of Creation as a benchmark. A benchmark yeah. that shows how much work needs to go into a project before it's even ready to test properly. Right. These are two passionate indie devs trying to push a monetized unfinished game into open development yes. with our feedback at the forefront of it it That's doesn't right. matter if the scope of the two projects are vastly different ashes of creation and it's Pax the same De concept they He's are right. both riding the same boat therefore i genuinely have to ask how much can mainframe really add to the game in such a small amount of time? The comp I don't think that this is the reality with live service games, is that live service games don't release whenever they are available to be played. And they never really release. They're evolving games that get better or worse over time, depending on the people that are steering the ship. Final Fantasy XIV or New World. Both of these games improved tremendously over their course of, uh, of existence. And then other games did not, like Lost Ark, for example. Combat is one of the main aspects the, of uh, any Western game version to of get right. So are they really planning to get the combat in a decent playable state in just three to four months of development? I want to splice in a few I clips so. on my interview with them just to give you guys some context of their plans for the combat, because there is indeed a lot of work to do in this field. Uh oh, maybe a couple of things. First off, like first off, like the combat skills didn't actually do anything. They were just there to because we hadn't kind of hidden them or whatever. They, they were just like there was some selection of skills in the combat combat list and I don't think any of them actually did yeah. anything in that part you know that's getting worked on and kind of cleaning that up and actually implementing that as part of kind of just like pro like a proper difficulty progression in the game because there yeah. wasn't really in the alpha there wasn't really meaningful kind of difficulty, difficulty progression when it comes to like you gearing up your character and like enemies actually becoming difficult the combat skills at least for a while like will still always like will will come from the from the item itself so like any kind of worn item might give you like grant you uh, a spell ability or spell because you really? So the items themselves will give you spells? Well, that's interesting. Okay. You would, like, you know, some relic or magical power into it. So like, one is skill. We, we don't have those, the skills for this yet, but, like, one is skill. So, like, this might be based on, like, some divine magic or there are, like, magical skills, basically, that we kind of plan that this might be based on that you could advance through, like, using spells that, like, rely on it or through, like, researching books. Sure. And secondly, through, like, passive effects. Are we talking about enchanting then? Is enchanting going to be its own skill in its own? Is it going to have its own crafting bench? How's, how's that going to work? Yeah, it's its own profession, basically. Now, with that shown, it is important to note that we have no idea about Mainframe's work ethic just yet. But this upcoming Alpha 2 test will definitely show us... Ex I'll, um... I can give maybe some tangential insight into this. Is that I actually think that Mainframe has a very healthy work ethic. And the reason why I believe that is that I remember that they said that they weren't going to be around during like different holidays and weekends whenever I was playing the game. So that implies that they do probably have a healthy separation between like working and having their own time. And they had mentioned that to me multiple times. So I, I think that really, I mean, that probably isn't going to be an issue. And I think, it, yeah, I think that's a good thing too. The Europeans, of course. Yeah. Exactly what they're made of and i'm genuinely genuinely rooting for them but then again at the end mm -hmm. of the day pax pay is labeled as a sandbox yeah, and that. this usually means the players yeah to be the... honest like I, I they were telling me they're like yeah we have the day off you know we'll we'll, we'll get back to you like uh, you know next week and i was like wait so like you mean you're not working all day every day what what what, what do you what do they do yeah, what do you what 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 are they gonna do then the content so they don't technically have to add anything mm -hmm. and to them the game is working as yeah. intended but as usual i am just one nerd desperate for a good mmo and my opinion means nothing without yours in the comments below mm -hmm. and by god it is important to put your comments below for this one because i'm curious about your thoughts if you've made it to the end of this video you probably enjoyed it so you know what to do to support it but preferably why not come and join us over at twitch.tv forward slash narcoverse where we sit around and talk about games that quite literally don't exist because we're high on copium
Damn, any game that hasn't come out yet is always going to be better than one that has. Because you can always imagine it being better than it is. So, yeah, I, th I mean, I think he brings up some good points, right? I mean, obviously, what it, when is the release date? I didn't see a date itself, right? I'm not sure. But um, sign up for the second alpha right here. What's this here? Uh, alpha sign up. We've got this. There's the news. One's for early access in spring this year. Where we stand on monetization. Um, so this is going to be them talking about the game. Actually, you know what? Let's read this because I haven't talked about this myself. Let me link you guys the video. It's a great NARC video. We brought it out today. And so make sure to uh, give it a like if you like the video and uh, give them a sub if you liked it. Been watching his content now for a couple of years. So yeah, there it is. Since we revealed PAX Day uh, months ago, uh, the game's intended business model has been a recurring uh, conversation in the community. We're sorry to say this is blog. We'll not give you the full details about monetization because we haven't figured it out yet. And that's on purpose. Uh, they're still trying to figure out what the model is. So what are the words below then? This is us sharing how we approach the topic to start the conversation. Okay, so I guess this is actually going to be really useful because like, if, if they're not really sure exactly like how they want to evolve the game, uh, hopefully like we can talk about it a little bit and give some insight into, you know, at least like what I'd want in my, you know, in, in my MMO, right? And so uh, ensuring that we can sustain and develop PAX Day in the long run uh, is driving the way that we think about monetization. With this in mind, PAX Day business model at launch will look something like this. A one-off initial purchase of the game. Okay, so the game is going to be buy to play. A regular fee for maintaining active player status in game plots. A regular fee. So you'd have to spend real money in order to uh, maintain a house. I'm not sure if I fully understand this. Um, I, I, I don't know really how that... Yeah, I, I don't know. Like a subscription supplemented with free but limited access to discover the game. Fully optional additional services added down the line. We're also considering a WoW token or a Plex Lite system. So they're talking about like adding in a, uh, a WoW token or something like that. Uh, I, I very much would be against this. Uh, the reason why I would be against it is because it creates a dollar value for every activity in the game. Farming a boss is now judged with every other method of farming in every game or in every in every avenue. And also, you're going to have way more people that are going to just buy gold at that point. Because let's let's just get down to the meat of it. You can buy resources. And then you can buy gold, so you can buy resources. You can use resources to advance your character. You can advance your character for real money. That's bad. That's it. That's bad. And so I hope that they don't do this. Uh, a WoW token, I understand it makes a lot of money, but it also, I don't think that with Blizzard, Blizzard had a WoW token and they didn't get rid of bots. I don't think that it worked. I think that Blizzard isn't bully I don't think that they're being fully transparent about the amount of bots and problems that they have. Like, I don't think that botting was any worse than it was, like, pre-2015, whenever they added the WoW token. I think it was always bad, or maybe 16. So I don't think it's even solved the problem. It's just a, a way to monetize the audience and allow people to buy and sell gold for real money. Uh, they did on retail, 99% of bots are on Classic WoW era. Um, I'd have to look and see because that certainly wasn't true during BFA and BFA had the WoW token as well. So if they had that, I mean, it obviously implies that like, you know, the WoW token wasn't the deciding variable. So yeah, I mean, the reason why a WoW token is bad is that it commodifies every single action in the game and it turns it into a dollar value evaluation. Like for a person like me, I'm a very optimize, I'm a very optimization driven person. I love optimizing things. I love optimization. I love trying to like min max stuff. I, I absolutely love this kind of stuff. And because of that, I, uh, I, 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 I'm farming something and I'm thinking to myself, I'm farming this. I think about how often I'm farming it, how many I'm going to get. I extrapolate that to one hour. I then think about how much I would sell it for. Then I think about how much I could buy a token for it. And then I realize that I'm farming for $3 an hour or $2 an hour. And then I stop farming. How many of you guys do the same thing? Yeah, you're optimized. Yeah, I, I feel like because I feel like I'm wasting my time. I feel like a I feel like I'm a fucking idiot. 
I, I'm a fucking moron for spending 20 hours to do something that I could have paid $20 to avoid. Yeah, it's a good point. Yeah, so it, it takes every single action and commodity in the game and it turns it into a dollar amount because people use the token as a frame of reference to judge every action and every activity in the game for. And that's exactly what happened in WoW. And it was bad. Farming is not worth it anymore. You're right, because you can buy gold. And then you look at your side and the bot's doing the same thing. Yeah, exactly. It feels wrong whenever, uh, when it's a game that's already pay to play. Uh, I, feel, I feel like it feels wrong no matter what, personally. I just don't like it. Same thing with Apex and Arcage. I can't speak to that. I never played that game. I just ignore that it exists and I play my game. I don't care to compare to others. Well, I, I think that... Like, I do, though. Like, I, I do want to I, I do want to have things that people are like, oh, that's really cool, right? I, I do want to earn those things. Is it a big deal? No, it's not as big of a deal as it was for me whenever I was a kid. But it's a multiplayer game, and, and that's why people buy skins. A lot of people do. And I get that, like, oh, maybe you don't really care about it. That's fine. But I think a lot of other people do. You can't buy Pyre and Apex? I think they were talking about RuneScape. Let's see here. And so, sustaining the game for the long run. We're building an MMO. Uh, scale and persistence aren't cheap. We have enough ideas to add content to Pax Day for years after the initial release. We're looking for a business model that feels fair to players and allows us to deliver, over time, our full version of the game. Uh, rules number one. Uh, we don't do direct monetization of performance or time skips. So I really, really, really disagree with this frame, with this framing, and I want to explain why. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to pull something up real quick. So this is an image that I created to illustrate the problem that this uh, that exists. So no direct monetization or performance of time skips. What is this? Like, are, are we stupid? It is functionally the same thing, and it will have the same effect. More importantly, it will have the same effect. Uh, the in-game economy is 100% player-driven. We, uh, What we sell must not compete with the value produced in the player-crafting economy. What we sell must not compete with the value produced in the player-crafting economy. What you sell allows them to compete against it. It creates the competition because it puts everything on the same wavelength. And it gives everything a dollar amount. And also being able to buy and sell things like this gives people an incentive to, to bot. Because now they can make real money with this, uh, uh, with this game. The shop will always make the baseline. Yeah, it is. What kind of anal cactus enjoyer wrote this? No, I actually really appreciate this statement. That's funny. But um, I, I really appreciate this article. And I should have talked about this earlier. Um, they're, they're being completely transparent. And they're talking about what their perspective is on the game. And I'm giving my feedback on it as they asked us to do at the top of the article. This is a good thing. That's why I'm talking about it right now. So... Direct monetization or in or indirect monetization, these are the same thing. They are 100% the same thing. I don't care whether you put an extra step in the middle here. It's still pay to win. I, I, I find it to be, it's almost like it's insulting to my intelligence that it's, not, it's anything else besides that. Uh, In-game autonomy is 100% player driven. It's not player driven. Uh, the moment that you put a dollar valuation on something you create a dollar valuation for everything else. Uh, we're transparent with our model. It's easy to understand what's an offer and easy to get in and out. Yeah, sure. Um, housing and handling and active players. Now let's take a bit of a detour to talk about what we think. And our early testers seem to agree is one of the most exciting features of PAX Day is housing. Um, in PAX Day, you're building your own home in the real world. In other words, the game allows you to claim land for your own usage, which is really cool. Whatever you're building can be seen and shared with other players, and you can build your own hamlets, villages, or even fully fleshed out towns. We look forward to seeing what will emerge for allowing players to collaborate with this. Uh, whatever gets built on a given player's plot must always be maintained. That's costly, not to mention technically challenging. We need a system to free up land once players leave the game or become inactive. 
I, I don't know. I think that you just have a traditional material degradation system where you have like a supply box or a supply bunker where you have a daily supply requirement and you have to fill up the decay. Yeah, it's like rust, right? And so, or, or like once human, like once human has this exact same thing, like you have to have those items in there. And if you don't, your building will slowly decay and fall apart. So what you have to do is like this auto, this will naturally solve the problem of players that are uh, of that are inactive because they won't be maintaining that. And then after they may, they don't maintain it anymore, then the plot is destroyed. And probably you make like after one or two days, if there's nothing that's being built on the plot, then uh, it's it's done. It, it gets reset. You lose your plot. I think that's the smart thing to do. Like, what do you guys think? Do you guys agree with that? What would you want to see? It could be abused, I think. Everything should be abused. Everything can be abused. Not having this can be abused. It's about what's the most fair. What's the least abusable? I think this is the least abusable. Uh, they need to text multiple ways. Yeah, you're right. They should try as many different things to do. It adds mundane busy work. Uh, it does. But I think the mundane busy work is worth it in order to create an evolving world that players have to do. Like, for example, there is a certain level of mundane busy work that does add texture to a game. Like, uh, I don't know, like farming cold drinks in Monster Hunter or uh, farming wood in New World. Do you really need to do this? No, you don't really need to do this, but it creates the experience. And also, like, I'm not talking about having to work three hours every day to maintain your building. I'm just saying, like, a reasonable degradation system or decay system that naturally removes plots of land from people that are clearly not playing the game. I, I'm not talking about like, oh my god, if you didn't farm for three hours today, your house gets destroyed. No, that we have enough of that in real life. Uh, I'm just saying something that's reasonable, that's all. Just pay a tax every week? I don't like taxes. I, I The only reason that you would want to do taxes is to remove infl uh, gold from inflation. I would prefer to not have taxes. I uh, need a system to keep up lands uh, inactive, crucially making the game allowed, uh, to avoid having areas of the game become ghost towns. True. Uh, therefore, we'll need a very robust system. Uh, therefore, we are uh, we intend to introduce a recurring fee for a maintaining player, active player status in game plots. So basically, you have to have an active subscription in order to build a house. Okay. But... There needs to be a way for a player who doesn't have that to have some degree of storage and some degree of crafting ability. Like they have to build like a main city or something like that. That way, those people aren't just like basically hobos. <laughs> it's just they're just hobos, right? Like it rumored and also and, and so like maybe maybe what they should do is they should do this. And they should start out without the town and see if the player base, if there can be emergent player behavior that comes from that. Hey, um, you know, you, you don't have a house. You don't have a subscription. I want you to come. Basically, feudalism. Can we reinvent feudalism for PAX Day? Let's have a beta and find out. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. That sounds super cool. Yeah, want to what? No, not slaves. No, they're not slaves. They're indentured servants. It's completely different, okay? Yeah, so I think this is great. Um, I, I'm a big fan, by the way. I am a massive fan of emergent player behavior. Allowing people to do crazy shit in games is one of my favorite things about games. This will allow us to have players' flexibility, choosing demand size. You have fully determine the uh, shape and size and price of it. Uh, the good old subscription model is something we're looking at still. There's considering other options for eye for balancing of simplicity of use. Um, so I, I agree with the subscription. And I agree that you should be able to play the game for free. Maybe doing it the way they're doing it is the right option. And there's a good part of me that thinks that it might be. The problem with that with feudalism is in control of banking and crafting will be infinitely worse than PvP ganking and world buffs. I know, but I want to see it happen. So the feudal lord controls all of the area, all of the... Oh my god, I, I, I could really make a great system out of this. Oh wow, this would be amazing. 
So you could have each group, right? It could be like a, a, a feudal lord could be able to enlist indentured servants into their uh, into their house and to use certain storage containers that the slaves or the servants could use. And then the feudal lord could choose to or not choose to allow them uh, to use their own resources that they farmed. So it would be up to the lord to make that decision. And that way you could create like a social dynamic out of that. Oh, that's really interesting. I, I really like that. Yeah, serfdom. Yeah, exactly. Like, that's really cool. It's like tiered guild access. Yeah, exactly. Forced conscription of peasants to fight in the feudal lords wars. Yeah, you could make a system for that. Sure. I really, I really think this has, this has real potential, guys. Oh my God. Free access and other options. Uh, around this core uh, and not over uh, defined yet system, we intend to develop a range of additional options. Let us emphasize the word options. None of what falls into this category should ever feel mandatory to enjoy the game. Uh, free but limited access, uh, additional services, convenience, and cosmetics are the areas to explore here. We haven't yet precisely defined our offer because we anticipate responding to the needs and appetites of player community. So let's talk about um, let's talk about this. So. Um, good, good, oops, excuse me, and bad. Okay, so these are going to be different monetization systems that games have. Um, sub, uh, sorry, uh, free to play, free to play, uh, no convenience, right? Uh, let's just say free to play. Okay, and this is all green. You can access everything in the game by being completely free to play. And there is no pay to win and nothing at all. And this right here is free to play with an added layer of a subscription that functions like Final Fantasy subscription or like um, the best example is Lost Ark's Crystalline Aura, where you have added advantages and benefits by paying the sub, but it is still different than, um, what do you call it? Uh, it's still different than, uh, what do you call it, than, than like, free-to-play, right? So, like, you have, like, free travel. Um, you have, uh, you know, like, you can access your bank anywhere. You have, like, certain types of convenience that are available to you if you pay your sub. And both of these systems are okay. But let me talk about what's not okay. And this is what I don't want to see. So we have the same thing free to play and then we have sub additional uh hey hey Hey, I have dyslexia, I have a big problem, but did I spell it wrong? No, I didn't, because I know I'm stupid, and I solved the problem myself. I don't want to ever hear some fucking dumbass say, Oh, I have dyslexia, so I have to talk like a fucking idiot. No, you don't. I know it's wrong. I fixed it. And this is the problem. And so anyway... Let me go ahead and explain why this is a problem after I do all of these for no particular reason whatsoever. So the red part is the problem because additional convenience transactions beyond the baseline of a sub creates a profit incentive for a game to continuously make the game more inconvenient. I think it's extremely reasonable and totally okay to ask somebody to pay and chip in regularly to play a game that's continuously developed and is bringing out content on a regular basis. 
But I find the problem is that whenever you have convenience transactions in a game, you lose the urgency that the developer has to make the game more convenient for the player. Because in fact, not only do you lose the urgency, but you punish the urgency because now you're not going to make as much money. So I am a very, very, very big advocate of no pay for convenience. And I think that pay for convenience is actually, in some cases, not all, just as if not more corrosive than pay to win. Because pay for convenience also does the same thing that a token does. Is it like how many of you guys played Lost Ark and you think to yourself, Una's task, I can do three of them and it costs me one dollar to instantly complete or I can go do them myself and it will take me 30 minutes. Do I want to make two dollars an hour or do I want to just pay money to skip it? How many of you guys made that decision yourself? It takes five minutes with the Bifrost. Okay, let's assume you don't have the Bifrost. Let's say it takes 10 minutes. Okay, how about 10 minutes? Okay, so $6 an hour. Do you want to make $6 an hour? There you go. So it, it, the point is still the same. And it's paid to skip the game. Yes, exactly. Please do not in, add in pay for convenience. And it, it, I am completely okay with one universal pay for convenience measure like a subscription. I am totally okay with that. But paying for more and more convenience, this is a huge problem. And it will be, it will be corrosive to the entire texture of the game. It will affect the entire game. How do I know that? I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen with many games. And that's why, like, I really hope that they decide to go with this. Like, I will play this game no matter what. Goes without saying. But how long I stick around is probably... Like, here's the reason why. And this is, like, a very weird thing that... I used to think that like, oh yeah, I would uh, I would pay to win if I if I could, right? Or whatever, when I was a kid. I'm like, oh, I wish I could do this. But now that I'm older and I have the money to pay to win in games, I have no desire to do so. Because the reason why I don't have any desire to pay to win in games is because I know I can. I know that I can spend my money. I could just outspend somebody and beat them. And because I know that, it makes the feeling worthless. It makes me feel like, oh, well, who cares? Like, I just spent more money than you and I beat you. Like, I'm not, I'm not better at the game. I'm not more skilled. I didn't outthink you. I didn't do anything. I'm just a fucking idiot. Yeah, you're losing, but I'm the one that's stupid. Agreed. A sub can even modulate its own value by adding more benefits, but doesn't incentivize monetization of inconvenience. Well, even if it does, it's okay because you should be expected to chip in. That's what my perspective is. I'll save this one. I think I'm going to use this a lot more often. So yeah, which devalues all progression in the game. Exactly. Like in Lost Ark, if you see somebody that's 1620 item level, do you think, wow, that guy really farms? Or do you think, wow, this guy's got a lot of these. Bro, he's got a lot of these. Oh my god. Look at all the... Look at all, bro, he's got a lot of... Yeah, exactly. He's spending a bunch of fucking money. And so... There's no, uh, there's no prestige in the game. What about upfront purchase price? A perfect game to me is a game that has a sub fee and that is buy to play for expansions. Uh, and, and for buying the base game. That is what I consider a perfect uh, monetization structure. Um, and that is perfect. Obviously a perfect, a perfect game to me is a war. It's free and I get everything. Hey, it's all everything free. But like, I'm talking about realistically. Uh, that's what I think is fair. I think PoE is also a perfect monetization enough to where like, I would say that it's good. Is there prestige in Lost Ark, but not everyone likes doing it? Yeah, yeah, sure. But like the gear isn't really one of those things of prestige. No store? No, I don't like having store cosmetics. I'm okay with it. I'll settle with cosmetics. I would prefer if it didn't exist, but it will never be a deal breaker for me. Does that make sense? Uh, those not spend enough time to press remote lives, work on EVE Online, World of Warcraft, be able to measure the benefits of offering a secure way for players to transact. Um, okay, so pay to play. This is, this is really important. Let's go ahead and read this. 
um, pay to play. Those of us who have spent enough time in our professional lives working on EVE Online or World of Warcraft have been able to measure the benefits of offering a secure way for players to transact real money for in-game resources between themselves. It helps increase the overall player population and activity by allowing the busier members of the community to keep up with their fellow players with more free time while making the game more accessible to others. It creates avenues for players to sponsor group activities in the game, and it's an important mechanism to fight against botting and other nefarious activities that will spring around every successful MMO. That's why we're considering offering it. Okay, so I think that they're wrong. Uh, it helps uh, increase the overall player population. Well, of course it does, because you have people from South America that are playing the game like slaves. This does not improve the game. It's not good. And also you have bots. Uh, and the activity by allowing busier members of the community to keep up with their fellow players with more free time. Well, if you're not investing the same amount of time into the game, then why should you get the same rewards because you spend real money? How do you think that makes the busier, the less busy members of the community, the people that are busy playing your game, how do you think that makes them feel whenever somebody is able to keep up with them just by paying $100? It makes them feel stupid and it makes them feel like they're wasting their time. And they are wasting their time and they are stupid because it's a video game and none of it really matters. But for just a little while, they can convince themselves that's not true. But whenever you have people that are able to pay money and rock it past you, the illusion is broken and it's not real. Yeah, then I play somebody else. Yeah, I am pro-delusion. Yes, I am pro-delusion because a delusion, a... a, a a happy delusion is better than a sad reality. And allowing people to buy tokens like this is the sad reality that people in video games, a lot of people play video games. One of the biggest elements of escapism in video games, and this is especially true for young guys. If you're a 16-year-old guy, if you're a 19-year-old guy, you're probably a fucking loser. You don't have any skills. Nobody's going to pay you to do shit. You have no resources. You're, you're good at nothing. And hopefully you get hired at Taco Bell. You're a level five. But you can go to these fantasy worlds. And you can be on the same playing field, playing field as somebody who makes a million dollars a year. And the even playing field is a very compelling reality for many people. And I also want to say that this too is a delusion. Because the person who's making, you know, working at their career 80 hours a week, they can't compete with you. In the same way that they have a resource that you don't have access to, you have a resource that they don't have access to. Which is time. Time is tremendously valuable. And, like, a 21-year-old Asmongold has a tremendous advantage over a 33-year-old Asmongold. Because I had all the time in the world to play the game, and I had nothing else that I ever had to do, and it was fucking amazing, and I loved it. I didn't want to hear that, but I need to. Yes, yes, that, that's just the truth. Right? How many of you guys? How many of you guys are the same way? Yeah, am I, am I crazy here? People want to have an escape from the reality of rich people being able to just buy advantages over you and make your accomplishments meaningless. One of the great things about a game like Elden Ring or Dark Souls, or Monster Hunter for that matter, is that if you beat the game, you earn that accomplishment. In Counter-Strike, if you're global elite, you earn that accomplishment. Sure, you can always have people that buy accounts, and there's always going to be ways that people get around it. But it's one thing if it's possible, and it's another thing if it's built into the system. So, what I'm saying is that I don't support in any way allowing people to buy and sell gold. And I want to talk about the rest of the things that they're saying here, and, and explain why I don't why I don't agree with it. Uh, give their fellow players some more free time while making the game more accessible to others. 
Making something more accessible doesn't always make it better. Because some people, like, accessibility is important, but so is making people feel good about their accomplishments. And whenever accessibility comes at the cost of making people feel good about their accomplishments, then it might not always be a good thing. Oh, well, you can just pay to catch up. Okay, great. Well, then what about the people that have been playing all the time? How do they feel about that? It makes you feel like your time isn't worth anything. It creates avenues for players to sponsor group activities in the game. I don't understand how this is true. I don't, this doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, because you can just pay for it with gold. Uh, it's an important mechanism to fight botting and other nefarious activities that will spring around every successful MMO. I don't agree with this either. New World doesn't have a WoW token, and New World has botting. Classic Era doesn't have a WoW token, and Classic Era has botting. Wrath of the Lich King doesn't have a WoW token, and Wrath of the Lich King has botting. Retail WoW does have a WoW token, and it does have botting. Season of Discovery has botting. They don't have a WoW token. It seems to me like people just bot every game. Wrath does have a token? I know that. I Did I misspeak? Sorry. Yeah, Wrath does have a token, and there's plenty of bots in Wrath. The token reduces the bot count for sure. How do you know that? What's the logic behind the token reducing the bot count? Yeah, like, cause, because logically to me, I don't see that being true. How do you know it doesn't? Because it doesn't make sense to me that it doesn't. And let me explain why. People that are buying gold will want to buy cheaper gold. Money is important for a lot of people. And many of the people, even in Wrath of the Lich King, are RMTing instead of using WoW tokens. Because it's cheaper. And, and like, if you're spending a lot of money, you're going to be doing this. That's why G2G is so popular. Yeah, you're right. Look at Soda. Yeah, Soda. Yeah, great example. Yeah, I mean, like, I'm not going to... We can't expose him here. He already said he did it. Soda bought gold and WoW. Do you think if there was the WoW token, he wouldn't have bought that gold? No, he would have just bought it anyway. And even if... And also, like, let me give you an example. And I always use this in Path of... I always use Path of Exile as an example for this. Path of Exile is a completely free game. And there are people that bought an RMT in that game. There are a lot of people that RMT in Path of Exile. I even one time was really desperate and I looked up the price for Exalted Orbs myself. And then I realized I'm not a pathetic fucking loser bitch, and I closed the website. But I did consider it. There has never been a point in Path of Exile, in the time of playing Path of Exile, that I have ever felt like RMTers negatively affected my play experience. I've never felt like that's ever happened to me. So if a completely free game is able to handle this, I expect every MMO to be able to do it as well. And I don't think that there is any justification or excuse not to. And I can use Blizzard as a frame of reference for this. How is it that there's 50 different advertisements for bots with the same names every single day in the group finder? Why does this happen? There's people fly hacking... Are you telling me that you can't make Z-axis thresholds? Get the fuck out of here. Of course you can. They're just... They're just lazy. Most of the currency sellers are not bots playing the game. They're bots trading currency from the website and such for PoE. Yeah, I appreciate those bots. Holy fuck. Uh, sorry, but uh, it gives the upper hand to the retailer like, wow, they control the price. Third parties have to undercut and that ruins their margin. Has there ever been a case where third party prices aren't below anyway? I feel like the WoW tokens were always more expensive than third parties. Now, obviously, they're much more compelling, but that's it. I feel like they've always been lower. 
Do you think it's more laziness or incompetence? I think it's neither. I think it's just cost cutting. That's why we're considering offering down the line our own variation of Plex or WoW token systems. Uh, to members of the community that have concerns with such systems, yes, we are reading conversations on our Discord. Our priority when designing the system will be to ensure that it contributes to the player-driven economy and the game's long-term health. Oh, it will contribute to it. The same as cigarettes contribute to somebody's health. Uh, that's why I made the rules. Having done it before, we can't guarantee it'll be perfect. Yeah, well, that that's my... Um, uh, that's my insight on it. Uh, I think this is a very bad decision for them to have a WoW token. Uh, or like a way to buy gold. I think if you do that, you commodify every aspect of the game. And you make everything have a dollar amount. Retail WoW is the best use and example for that. It kills people's sense of accomplishment for doing anything. So yeah. This is something that they're considering. And that's why I'm offering my feedback. I remember playing this game and I had a lot of fun playing it. And I, I, I hope that I will whenever it comes out. But I will say that this will be a massive handicap for that enjoyment. And maybe not even for me, but for a lot of other people it will be. That's what I think. Overall, I agree with almost everything except for the WoW token. Everything else is completely reasonable. It breaks immersion if you know gold has a money value. Yeah. Uh, here's how bad it is in WoW. There's an add-on that actually automatically converts the amount of money that you're trading to dollars. This is maturity of this system. This is not even its final form. This is just the current form that it's in. That's sad. It is sad. And it's also real. RMT is definitely a problem in POE in terms of economic inflation, but it's much less noticeable because there's no auction house. As much hate as POE gets for its trade, the current system is actually an overall W for combating problems like this. Yeah, I'd like to see them experiment with an auction house for only currency in PoE2, because I feel like currency trading is really unfun and frustrating to do. But um, selling gear, I think, should stay the same. And I'm not even saying that they should have an auction house, but I would like to see them try it and just see if it would work. And if it doesn't, then get rid of it. Betas are a long time, uh, you know, and PoE2 is, you know, going to be developed over a long period of time, and so... I, I hope that happens. PoE has no leaderboard really either. No, it doesn't. It has, um, you know, those like uh, announcements in, in the uh, in like the general chat, but that's it. Whenever like, you know, oh, first person to kill it's Eerie or Shaper or whatever, right? I don't understand why Pax Day devs say it will be 100% not be pay to win. And then they say it will have a token. Well, this is what they're saying. And this is what my feedback to it is. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's just that's, that's all there is to it.